I'm back again, you can't get rid of me. Uh, so we'll move right into the case to just to reflect the relevance of mitral regurgitation in heart failure. There's really a lot of facets to mitral regurgitation. Um, there's one case that covers a, a one aspect of mitral regurgitation and we'll hopefully we'll have time to discuss about others. And I mean, um, I'm, I'm in no way an expert in mitral regurgitation. We have people who specialize in imaging. So if anybody here um, has any specific comments on the imaging that I'll show you, I'll have to call my colleagues back in, back in Methodist. But we'll, we'll talk about this case. It's an 87-year-old male with two years history of congestive heart failure symptoms. He initially presented with an acute decompensated state, just like what Dr. Faraz showed you. But prior to that, he was a functional guy. At 87, he was going skiing, he was walking around. And then when he got admitted at that time, um, that was his first major medical problem that he had. So after that, through those two years, he had atrial fibrillation. He was known to have mitral regurgitation, which ranged anywhere from moderate based on the uh, echocardiogram uh, to some which called it severe. He also had tricuspid regurgitation, had GI bleeding. There was a question mark of liver cirrhosis in these last two years, chronic thrombocytopenia. He essentially was in and out of the hospital for two years in a local hospital of our system, and, and ultimately the family essentially insisted and fought saying, send us to, in Houston we have a medical center and there are seven peripheral hospitals that are connected. A lot of people want to come to the medical center when things get complex. So they insisted that they come to the medical center to get an opinion about why he's continuing to fail. So that's how we ended up getting transferred into our hospital. Uh, again, but this time he presented again with severe volume overload. He's debilitated now. He went from being active and walking around doing everything in two years to swollen legs, too heavy, can't walk. Uh, that's why he was in rehab and hospitalization, as Faraz pointed out, uh, by itself is a stress and strain on, on the physiology uh, of, of any individual. Uh, so, as, as I said, multiple hospitalization for shortness of breath, some were called as pneumonia, GI bleed, gradual worsening of his functional status. So this was his chest x-ray on presentation, um, and I'm sure everybody noticed the congestion, the plethora of the pulmonary vasculature, uh, the, the, the apex of the heart is not really moved down too far out for us to call it's a dilated left ventricle. Um, and, and of course the right side, the right sided silhouette is a little um, uh, kind of camouflaged with the pulmonary vasculature. Blood work that you see up there, I threw a few of them. Sodium, um, sodium is 143, potassium is low. Uh, BUN, creatinine is 1.3 for an older individual as GFR was definitely compromised. Uh, total bilirubin of note is 2.5. AST, ALT are okay. Um, direct bilirubin was 1.6. BNP is high at 946, not in the 6,000 range that uh, Faraz showed. Uh, white count and hemoglobin, they're fine. Platelets are quite low and INR is 1.3. So how many here by a show of hands think this gentleman is in acute decompensated heart failure state? Faraz, I think you have to repeat your lecture again. <laughs> I'm sure everybody thinks it's, uh, he's in acute decompensated state and he has a history of heart failure. This is quite, quite obvious that he does have a uh, congested state. The things that throw us off are, of course, Creatinine is not bad in the realm of things. Total bilirubin is high, and AST, ALT is not that high. Right? So these are certain profiles which are relevant to, to, to think about. Um, in, in my clinical practice, I've seen where your bilirubin is a more of a prognosticator than AST and ALT when you have a chronic, a chronic 
heart failure without an acute injury. When you have acute hyperperfusion, your AST ALT goes up. Um, if it's interesting when you look at the path pathology of the hepatocytes, the maximum mitochondrial energy utilization lies in the tracts where your bilirubin is being mobilized out. So, and that's my hypothesis, no publications that I can quote. But that's the reason in certain chronic low perfusion states, the and individuals have an unexplained high total bilirubin, which is a worse prognosticator to me because it gets missed quite a bit, normally AST, ALD, total bilirubin. So that's something to keep in mind in this scenario. This is this EKG, atrial fibrillation, bundle branch block, which I think has a PVC. Now, I, I don't have a baseline before his heart failure symptoms, and how much of this is, you know, optimization versus not uh, is, is, is relevant. He does get a CT scan of the abdomen, pelvis, which because of his total bilirubin, uh, the heart is enlarged, is what shows up on the abdomen CT scan, bilateral effusions, moderate abdominal ascites, um, and both pancreas, adrenal glands are okay, uh, and then extensive arthritic changes are noted involving the spine wedge compression. It's an old man, 87 years old, is, is getting old. This is the echocardiogram. How many here are familiar with echocardiograms? By raise of hand, quite a few. But there are some who are not familiar, so we'll just walk through quickly. Hopefully I can control this. This is a parasternal long axis section. Essentially, if you take the heart and then slice it through the long, uh, uh, the apex, and you're looking at it from the side, and what you see is the left ventricle, this is the left ventricle, this is the left atrium, and this is the mitral valve here, that's the aortic valve, and this is your RV, a piece of the RV that you see. But this view gives you a good idea of the left ventricle, the valve. And then when you put color Doppler, the concept of color Doppler is essentially directional, that you're having ultrasound waves give you a color to the direction of flow and the velocity of it. So what you're looking at in that picture, is if you time it with systole, whenever the heart squeezes, you should not have blood flow into the atrium, right? That's what mitral valve does. It closes the valve so that in systole, there's not blood flow into the left atrium. What you see here is clearly if you notice that whenever the LV squeezes, you see a bunch of color in the left atrium, and that's mitral regurgitation. So in systole, color in the left atrium is mitral regurgitation. Now it looks very colorful, right, which means that there's a lot of turbulence and probably quite a bit of velocity. The only caveat with that is um, for people who read echoes, they understand you can make anything look worse by adjusting the, uh, the velocity over there, so you want to make sure that's accurate. So mitral regurgitation in, in, a, in a heart failure patient is not uncommon. A lot of, actually, a lot of hearts have some mitral regurgitation. It's the question of, is this mitral regurgitation bad enough that it is causing the problem, or is this mitral regurgitation just a sidetrack cons uh, a, a consequence of congestive heart failure. Um, maybe to make it interactive, uh, if the chairperson doesn't mind, we can probably have a discussion here. If anyone wants to comment, what, at this stage, does anybody have an idea on, this is the chicken or the egg, which came first? Do we think this heart failure is the cause, or do we think is the consequence? We have a taker there. Yes, sir. So what, what he said astutely is this, he thinks this is the, you can please give the mic. I think for us to, what, what makes you think so, if you don't mind, 
I think that it's a very good astute observation. His comment is that this is a uh, primary mitral problem with a mitral prolapse uh, that's contributing to it. If you can repeat uh, with the mic, I think people yeah. will. Yeah, you see that uh, the, the mitral regurgitation is not central, which is usually for functional mitral regurgitation. It's an uh, uh, anteriorly directed jet of uh, what seems to be severe MR. Uh, most probably it's uh, secondary to posterior leaflet prolapse. Yeah, so posterior leaflet prolapse is the uh, uh, presumed diagnosis. Um, based on his observation, which I think is, is clear that central versus eccentric. Also, what's important to realize is that when it's eccentric, it's easy to miss it, depending on who's reading it and how you're reading it. And that's why I said when somebody has heart failure, in my mind, the two valves which are easy to miss or not be very accurate are aortic and mitral, especially regurgitations. And Sometimes, based on the uh, ASC recommendations, you have to do another imaging test. So let's see what, what it pans out. I'm not saying he's right or wrong yet, so we'll see. And this is a different uh, view of the tricuspid valve, uh, which also was pointed out on, on the, the left side is a tricuspid valve that you see. The picture on the right side is your mitral regurgitation, which again is very, very eccentric. So again, multiple pictures show this view. The one up here is a, a cross section of the aortic valve. So this is a short axis. Now you're not cutting the heart in the long axis, but you're cutting it in the short axis at the aortic level, so as the aortic valve is coming out, so you see the cross section of the tri-leaflet of the aortic valve. And then the left atrium is behind it. And you see how the, the jet, the color jet is in systole and it's hugging to the wall. And that's where MR can be missed very easily. And that's called as Coanda effect. A Coanda effect means that when you have a a, a, a lateral hugging wall, it's actually probably severe that you're not able to see. In fact, some of the recommendation is if you have that and you think it is moderate based on the calculations, you probably upgrade it to severe. And again, any imagers here want to correct me, please do. Please feel free to correct me. So the final conclusion of the ECHO official read from our lab was it's moderate eccentric LV hypertrophy, RV severely enlarged, RV is moderately depressed, moderately severely depressed, and then the mitral valve was called as moderately thickening of the valve, can't exclude a regurgitation that is eccentric and posteriorly directed, um, tethered posterior leaflet noted, estimated regurgitation fraction of 65%, which is quite high, and then, of course, they said, let's do a TEE if needed. We believe in testing in the U.S., keep doing more tests. Um, and like concluding. So at this stage, what are our options? Are we convinced enough, like the gentleman who pointed out, is the mitral valve the problem in an 87-year-old guy with platelets of 15, and RV looks bad? How many here would take him to a mitral valve surgery? We have some surgeons in the room who can comment on. So we have one word for Two, two, three words for surgery, four words for surgery. How many here would consider a percutaneous clip, mitral clip? Okay, so we have more words, more cardiologists than surgeons in the room, so that always is a bias. How many would say aggressive I, IV diuresis and then high-dose torsamide, which is oral medication, we're not touching the mitral valve. We have a, f we have a few words which are reasonable. How many would say he's getting sick? Refer to God. Palliative care, say sorry, we can't help you. We always refer to God. I'm sorry? We always refer to God. I, I can't hear you. We always refer to God. We always refer to God. That's true. I mean, we leave things in the hands of God. Uh, and then I don't know what you're asking about because I just woke up. I presume people would be sleeping by now, but they're not. So let's see what happens. And it's important for surgical consideration, and, and we can have some discussion with the surgeons. The STS risk score 
definitely gives you an operative mortality. So when I plugged this in for this gentleman last night using his variables at that time, his risk of mortality is quoted at about 20%. And I think just by the fact of his age, uh, it gets skewed. Now that doesn't mean in the right hands surgery is not an option, but the question of cirrhosis, the question of 87-year-old debilitated is quite relevant. So I would commend a surgeon who would take him in and succeeds not just in the surgery, but be able to rehab after. But it is a viable option on the table to discuss. Concluding that the mitral valve is the problem, because like we talked initially, if you don't fix the problem that's causing it, no matter what you do with medicines, things are not going to get better. So we elected to go down the mitroclip route. Our surgeons were not as bold as you guys here. So we chickened out. We said, let's do the mitroclip. These are TEE. And for the lack of time, I'll move a little quick. But in the TEE, you can see, uh, you can see that the, the, that's the transeptal with the mitra clip going across the septum. And you see the 3D reconstruction images. And I think one of that, you can see that mitra clip over here kind of clipping the, the cardae. Uh, same thing on this, that you see that silver kind of echogenicity. Uh, and essentially, the conclusion of the procedure was there was severe MR as appropriately suspected with a P1 and P3 flail. Uh, those are parts of the posterior leaflet. They put in two mitroclips, and final residual MR was mild to moderate. Um, and that's just the cat lab. Uh, of course, mitroclips are done in the cath lab, along with TE guidance and interventional, and you see two clips being deployed over there. And the repeat echocardiogram uh, still shows the regurgitation, but it's not as bad and not as eccentric. And these were the hemodynamics of, no, this is a right heart catheterization picture. Uh, if I can point out over, let me see if I can. So over there, you notice that the pressures the V-wave went from 30, that's the wedge pressure, left atrial V-wave went from 30 down to 9 after the clip. And that's a significant improvement in the regurgitation uh, and the mitral regurgitation. And that's the patient after two years in my office, very functional, back to normal. So it's easy to, to get skewed by the site in front of you if you get sick. And these are the total bilirubin values, which were the peak was when before the mitral valve, the peak of BNP, and after the mitral valve, really everything came down. We never got hospitalized after that. So to wrap up, MR and heart failure uh, essentially can go together. In general, mitral regurgitation is a bad prognosticator. The differentiation is this was a primary MR, which is a degenerative MR, which has been approved in the US for a percutaneous for patients who've been declined for surgery. Somebody who's a surgical candidate should probably get a surgical uh, repair, preferably versus replacement. Uh, and of course, mortality with the mitral clip is definitely lower in this high-risk individual compared to surgical replacement that you see going up to almost 13% even in valve surgical replacement. What's relatively new is fixing secondary MR, which is not this case, but in individuals who have a large LV and you have the central jet, now mitroclip has been approved for these situations where the surgical revascularization, surgical correction is much higher risk in these individuals and the yield is low. So in general, if somebody has severe MR, the algorithm is make sure they're not end stage. If they're stage D, end stage, don't try to go fix the valve. But if they're not end stage, you still want to optimize them with medications, optimize them with BIV, because all these improve MR. I can make any heart failure patient's MR look worse just by decompensating them. After all that options of up titration, if you still have severe MR with an ERO, which is up to 40 based on the COAP trial, I think these are individuals in today's world that can be considered for fixing the mitral valve. With that, I want to also point out that decisions like these are multidisciplinary. 
as heart failure specialists, we have to engage all these specialties to come up with the final uh, distinction. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this uh, interactive session, Ramzi. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, we see a lot of mitral regurgitation in patients with heart failure. And um, uh, we, the tendency is to try to treat these patients medically first. A lot of these patients have mild, maybe moderate mitral regurgitation. We always um, try to treat them with medications, increase the, the diuretics, maybe the, 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 you know, the positive inotropic agents. Um, when do we make a decision that this patient is no longer candidate for medical therapy and it's time to move on to uh, um, repairing the mitral valve with whatever? So I think it's a very relevant question. The most important thing is to make sure it's not primary MR. If you have a prolapse or a flail leaflet, then it's not secondary to heart failure. But once you, if you think it is secondary heart failure, it's still important to maximize your medica medical management. In fact, that was the major distinction in the two trials for secondary MR, where one was positive, one was negative, one in the US, one in France. The positive trial, which we were a part of, was very strict. The committee that approved it would not, would not let us enroll a patient unless we were on maximal tolerated AC inhibitors, maximal tolerated beta blockers. And what's interesting is we have seen, when we recruited patients who have severe MR, you put them on the right medications, it becomes mild. So you want to maximize the medicines, but if you're not able to, if you're hypotensive and you're struggling and your MR is still severe and they're not responding the way you want, I think it's important to consider fixing the valve probably earlier than not in secondary MR. Primary, I think we want to probably fix it sooner than later. There is one caveat in this because if you have a structural problem, I think you go and fix it. Once you have a functional problem, it's very tricky because you need to know whether it is a proportionate MR or disproportionate MR. If the patient having disproportionate MR, which is much more than what his LV expected to have an MR, I think these are the patients who will benefit. And the difference, as you mentioned, with COAPT and the other studies is that COAPT was more of disproportionate mitral mitra regurgitation compared to other trials, and the LV volume also was smaller. So once you have very advanced heart failure, you may not benefit from uh, right. fixing the mitral valve. So I think this is the basic of uh, potential intervention in patients with heart failure and mitral regurgitation. No, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation, but uh, being, uh, I'm Dr. Wafa, I'm an uh, internist uh, and palliative uh, physician. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, to make a point which is putting the patient in the center of the decision making. It has to be the goals of the patient and the family sometimes in our country, sometimes we uh, hear our culture trying to hide the a true uh, actual status of the patient from the patient himself. So the family are the decision makers. So the caregiver or the primary physician should be uh, in full explanation and giving the full uh, explanation for the patient and the options. We have limitations here, we don't have so many options, but at least in such a condition, referring to hospice mm -hmm. or uh, not doing anything can be a wise decision prepare, uh, considering the social, uh, socioeconomic status of the patient and family and at the same time putting the uh, respect to the goals of care among the patient and the family. No, no doubt about it. I think it's a whole session on itself, but palliative options and patient-centered decision-making appropriately with a balance I think is very important. So it, we spend a lot of time having that relationship with palliative care doctors because they're two extremes. I always tell my trainees it's easy to give up because it's easy to say you're 87 year old, you look bad, go home. But on the other hand, it's also easy not to respect their wishes. So you have to balance those acts and then definitely have it. Thank you very much, Arvind. I think we will continue for the sake of time. Um, the next